So good afternoon and welcome. I'm Mary Naylor, director of the New Cortland Center for Transitions and Health based at Penn School of Nursing. For those of you who may not know, the New Cortland Center is comprised of scholars who share in common a commitment to advanced science related to the care of diverse groups of adults with very complex health and social needs. The center also focuses on science that supports their caregivers. A unique focus of the center's work is uncovering the unique contributions of nurses in improving the health and quality of life of these at-risk groups and maximizing on the use of our findings to positively impact clinical practice and health and social policies. The center's webinar series enables us to bring together amazing thought leaders to engage in conversations about issues of tremendous societal importance. Today's sessions on the many facets of moral distress among healthcare workers is a prime example of our efforts to gain a deeper understanding of such an issue and to explore potential solutions. Frontline workers remain at the center of the COVID pandemic. They shoulder the burden of a highly infectious virus that has infected more than 43 million Americans and taken the lives of more than 700,000 loved ones. Every day for the past 18 months, healthcare workers have confronted unparalleled ethical challenges in their efforts to deliver high quality care to very sick, often dying patients in settings where critical resources and support often are lacking. They have faced substantial challenges and risks to their own health and well being, as well as those of their families and friends. Across the globe, more than 115,000 healthcare workers have died from COVID. Today, we have assembled a distinguished group of panelists whose tireless work has heightened our awareness of the impact of moral distress, particularly that on frontline workers, including nurses. And importantly, a group of panelists who are offering solutions to mitigate the impact of this crisis. Throughout this conversation, I'd like to encourage our audience to take advantage of the chat function to raise questions or provide comments. The panelists will address as many of the issues that you pose during this webinar, but we're also going to be sending that to the panelists so that it can inspire them for their continued work. Uh, this session will be taped and available to you within a couple of days. To introduce our panelists and moderate today's session, let me turn to Dr. Connie Ulrich, a scholar extraordinaire and a treasured, truly treasured colleague. Dr. Ulrich is the Lillian S. Bruner Chair in Medical Surgical Nursing, Professor of Nursing and Medical Ethics and Health Policy, and Associate Director of the New Cortland Center. Her program of research focuses on advancing empirical bioethics in both clinical practice and research, including the ethical issues that healthcare workers encounter in their daily clinical practice and the stress these issues engender. Connie, thank you for moderating today's session and bringing together such an extraordinary group of panelists. Thank you so much, Mary, and thank you so much for those very kind words. It is a pleasure to be here this afternoon to have a discussion with our distinguished panelists focused on the many facets of moral distress across healthcare settings. Moral distress is a term that has been around for some time in the bioethics world. And sometimes it is a term that has been misunderstood, but this term has taken on a new sense of urgency, as Mary said, with the COVID-19 pandemic. The original definition by Andrew Jamison almost 40 years ago spoke of how nurses were not able to meet their ethical obligations to patients because they knew, or perhaps they thought they knew what was the right thing to do but organizational constraints prevented them from following a course of action that they believe to be right. Several of us have redefined moral distress more broadly, recognizing that nurses, physicians, and other clinicians are often placed in morally undesirable situations that they actually perceive to be morally undesirable, and it can have profound effects on their mental and physical health and well being. But critical debate remains on this concept, and there are those who argue that perhaps we should redirect our focus. However, with COVID-19, we have seen distress across all aspects of our society, as Mary has indicated, with clinicians, with patients, with families, and with everyday citizens just trying to understand the impact of an infectious virus. Today, the statistics remain troubling, with one in every 500 US residents having died from the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and more than 3,600 healthcare workers died during the first year of the pandemic 
and about a third of this group were nurses. And we know that there have been devastating effects internationally as our colleagues have spoken to us about that. And hospitals and other systems across the country are struggling to provide needed care for patients who enter their doors. 10 states were at crisis standards of care or ready to enact them as of mid-September due to the Delta variant. So we have a lot to talk about today and we have a wonderful group of interdisciplinary group of scholars to shed light on the concern of moral distress and I would like to introduce them to the audience. Christine Grady is the chief of the Clinical Center's Department of Bioethics at the National Institutes of Health and a nurse bioethicist. Her bioethics research and scholarship has been extensive, focusing on a wide variety of ethical topics, including both research and clinical ethics. She has also published widely in books and, and journals on topics in bioethics, ranging from research ethics to moral distress in clinical practice. She has also served on President Obama's Presidential Bioethics Commission. She is a Hastings Center Fellow and a member of the National Academies of Medicine and Nursing. Nancy Berlinger is a research scholar at the Hastings Center, a bioethics research institute in New York. Dr. Berlinger's research focuses on the ethical and societal challenges arising from an aging population. She has also focused her work on the special challenges that clinicians face in clinical practice, especially around the safety and harm in health systems and the moral dimensions of that work and workarounds. She directs the Hastings Center Visiting Scholars Program, including the newly Sadler Scholars Program for doctoral students from minority communities. And Margaret Krawetz is the Director of Nursing Services at Greenhurst Nursing Center in Arkansas. This is a subacute and long-term care facility specializing in skilled nursing, rehabilitation, long-term care, hospice, and dementia care. She received her master's in administration and has extensive nursing experience across the healthcare continuum in facilities of varying sizes and types. And Greenhurst has approximately 120 employees, 102 or probably more residents and their families to which she has helped to shepherd through the COVID-19 pandemic and to provide up-to-date and timely implementation of policies and mandates through the regulatory authorities throughout the pandemic. Margaret is also a major in the US Army and she has received Army Achievement and Commendation Awards and Merit Service Medal with one Oak Leaf Cluster. So we thank her for her service and we thank her for being here and all the panelists for being here today. So let me start with a broad question to all the panelists. As we've been living with this pandemic for more than a year, I recently read a comment that, that said the following, a year and a half into what the World Health Organization officially declared a pandemic on March 11th, 2020, it's an understatement to say that Americans are exhausted. So I'd like to ask you, each of you, if you could talk to us a little bit about what each of you have found to be the most ethically troubling during the pandemic with what you have seen, perhaps what you have heard, or perhaps what you have experienced as scholars, as bioethicists, as clinicians, and or as citizens. And I'll start, Nancy, if I could start with you, that would be sure. great. And then Christine and, and Margaret. Sure, um, thank you everyone. Uh, that's a great first question, Connie, and it really speaks to me because I'm a resident of New York City. And so um, March uh, 2020 was experienced as a true uh, state of emergency here in the city and for many weeks afterwards. And I think in reflecting back on this question, I would say that what is what is so troubling, I know we're gonna talk about specific clinical frontline experiences to come, but I think the thing that is so troubling is our collective inability as a society to recognize that a public health emergency requires a coordinated, trustworthy public response at every level. Mm -hmm. um, I visited Denmark recently, just last month, and it was striking to see how COVID is spoken of in the past tense there. It was a thing that happened and we dealt with it. They call it Corona. Uh, and whenever I talked with locals, um, they said the same thing. They said, well, we trust our institutions. So when something is called a public health issue or public health emergency, we look to our, our institutions to tell us how we, we should respond. Mm -hmm. And they said, of course, we look out for each other all the time. So there's high public trust around sure. matters large and small. <laughs> and there's no magical way to make American society into a society like Denmark. But it was telling how quickly a society can get organized and come out of a crisis when there's that high degree of trust and coordination. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. And we're definitely going to be talking about trust and mistrust 
uh, within the healthcare system today. Christine? Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, thank you for including me in this panel. And I think some of my comments will sort of actually build on Nancy's in a certain way. Because when I was thinking about this, I, I think the first thing I want to say is there were so many ethically troubling things that came out of this pandemic, including things like the glaring inequities in our society, the structural determinants of health that are all messed up, mm -hmm. uh, fissures in some of our societal structures like the public health system, as Nancy mentioned, but also elder care. Yes. I think Margaret will speak to child yes. care, safety nets for all kinds of people. Uh, how we how we even do end of life care, I think, is is an interesting uh, thing that has emerged a little bit. But I do want to say, I mean, I know this panel is focusing on, on moral distress, and I do think that that is a huge issue in this pandemic. Um, I think we all know moral distress isn't new, but during the pandemic, healthcare professionals across the board and lots of other people that are not healthcare professionals, I think, have experienced moral distress because of things they've had to do or things they weren't able to do. Um, and it is definitely a ubiquitous problem that we're going to have to address now and in, into the future. Yeah, thank you very much, Christine. Totally agree with that. Um, and Margaret, your, your thoughts here? Okay. Um, I, I think for me, the most ethically troubling, uh, I'll answer this in three parts. Uh, first would be isolating residents from other residents in a long-term care setting. Sure. We, we had to cancel group activities, things like as simple as, as the dining room uh, mm. had to be canceled. Uh, having guests come in, which is part of, of their joy in the day, having, having different guests come in, um, church groups, uh, piano players, dancers, things like that were all canceled. And uh, that was difficult for the residents. Uh, the second thing would be separating the residents from their loved ones, mm. uh, particularly people who had dementia, uh, who didn't understand no matter what we said, what was going on. Uh, but it also caused distress for their families, particularly for the dementia residents because the families weren't sure whether at the end they would recognize their own family members anymore. Mm. Uh, and, and that's heartbreaking uh, when you've got someone that says, will mom even know who I am? Um, so that, that was difficult. Uh, the third part was uh, not so much uh, a, a social aspect, but more physical one of having to administer PCR tests mm -hmm. twice a week. Uh, which was our mandate uh, from the government uh, mm -hmm. to residents that had dementia that didn't understand what was going on. It's not a comfortable procedure for anyone, but for a dementia resident in particular, sure. it's, it's hard uh, for the caregiver who's trying to collect the specimen and hard for the resident and hard for the staff who have been taught that we don't force uh, residents to do something uh, and and yet we, for the safety of all, we had to administer these tests. So sure. that, uh, that was different. Uh, also residents who are hearing impaired, when you put a mask on, they can no longer lip read. So there were a lot of, mm. a lot of social isolation things that would, would go on uh, from, from that perspective. So those, those are my thoughts on that. Thank you, thank you all. I mean, I, I absolutely agree with all of you and, and one of the um, audience members did recognize that I think to Nancy's point about how the fragmentation sort of speaks core foundation issues we experience here in the United States that we have seen fragmentation across a variety of different healthcare institutions and the stressors I think as Margaret and Christine have indicated. I'd like to ask you a question about um, you know, this concept of moral distress because I think you know, as, as some of you know, in some of our work, we have heard that moral distress is endemic <laughs> especially within hospital systems. And some of our participants in some of the work that we have done have told us that it's just the norm and you really just cannot see it anymore. Because I think, as indicated, there were times when nurses and staff felt as though they couldn't meet patients' needs, I think as Margaret just indicated, or they thought uh, they needed to do something that perhaps went against their own moral values and belief systems. And studies have indicated that nurses and others have experienced a host of emotional issues, including fear and anxiety and grief and isolation and worry and fatigue and anguish and even trauma. 
And there was an article that was written by a nurse in Tennessee about her experience in an ICU. And she poignantly said that she felt as though she were, were in purgatory, seeing death daily. And I think as Margaret indicated that we have also seen patients and their families have had similar emotions with worry about themselves and their loved ones, and sometimes anger. So we've seen this within hospitals and other types of systems across the United States. So, so my question to you, is this, you know, do you think that the term moral distress really covers the range of emotions that we have seen during the pandemic? We know that moral distress can lead to feelings of powerlessness and other physical and sort of psychological concerns, but does it cover the depth of the issues that we have seen and that all of you have just indicated in my opening question to you? Or is it something else? Christine, I, Christine go ahead. You want me to start? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so in direct answer to your question, Connie, I do not think moral distress covers the range of emotions at all. I mean, I think some of them you've named already, you know, people, healthcare workers in particular are stressed, they're exhausted, they're stretched thin by just the sheer volume of care that they have to the daily demands of caring for people with COVID and worrying about their other patients. They're frustrated because of lack of resources. They're frustrated by lack of communication or by COVID denial. They're sad because of the repeated deaths and they're sad because of repeated deaths and loss despite their best efforts to try to prevent them. And they're worried and they're worried about their families and they're worried about their own health and their own well being, and, and they're worried about the future. And all of that, I think those are all emotions that I see and I think are justifiable. And I think over the top of them or something like that, in addition to all of those, there's moral distress. Mm -hmm. And the moral distress kind of complicates some of the other emotions because I don't think that people always distinguish what, which is which. Um, but I do think there's a lot of moral distress also, but also sadness, frustration, fear, worry, and just stress in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Nancy, did you want to comment? Um, uh, yes, to, to add to, I, I fully agree with everything Christina said. And um, from uh, studies of COVID frontline clinicians that I've been involved in, uh, some involve uh, interdisciplinary teams, um, a study that Connie has led involving uh, uh, clinical ethicists and also uh, uh, several studies involving physicians, it's clear that moral distress is a term that some clinicians are familiar with, perhaps because it's used in clinician education. So they've heard the term and they might use it, but it's not at all clear that everyone uses this term in the same way or that if somebody doesn't mm -hmm. use it, that's not what they're feeling. So I think we need to worry less about the term and more as, as, as Christine said, the spectrum of emotions that people are trying to talk about. And it's hard to talk about feelings. You might grasp for metaphors to talk about what your feelings. Also some other terms like moral stress or moral injury may be more research terms mm -hmm. than used by clinicians in everyday speech. They may have their uses, but I think we have to be careful if terms are, are used in one, like a used in, in combat veteran uh, studies, and then we apply them to clinician studies when somebody says it's Ooh. like a war, it may not mean exactly the same thing. So we have sure. to be careful about that. Um, we know that clinicians may use terms like soul drained when they are that are not research terms just to get to their feelings like the nurse who said she was in purgatory. We've also seen over time people rejecting hero language very strongly. Yes. We've heard from uh, researchers in, in we, you know we've been doing several studies of doctors in different cities and over time you know you start doing research when people are getting you know lots of applause. And now we are hearing about clinicians trying to scrape those uh, stickers off the ones that say are heroes or something. Mm. They're just saying, I reject this. You know, I don't feel like a hero in, in this and I don't wanna be called that. Um, so one aspect of learning from COVID is trying to understand this range of emotional responses, including those with ethical dimensions without getting stuck on one term or imagining mm -hmm. that one term that was conceived as, of, as to describe the, the stress of normal work could ever uh, work to describe a pandemic context. Sure, thank, thank you, Nancy. And Margaret, I mean, I guess I'm wondering, Margaret, did, I mean, your staff, you know, working with vulnerable populations, surely patients and families, as you indicated, were distressed, but I'm not sure if they use the term moral distress. I mean, did you 
perceive that in any particular way or the eth with the ethical struggles that they were facing that you told us about? Well, I, I agree with both of the other panelists that, that moral distress is, is probably insufficient to, to cover the expanded range of emotions, either by families or, or by the healthcare workers. Uh, personally, I think exasperation, uh, both physical and mental exhaustion, resentment uh, yeah. towards people who are not doing what you expect them to do, frustration, mm -hmm. uh, and, and for me, just a state of dumbfoundness at, at some of the explanations as to why people are choosing to do what, what they choose to do uh, contributed to my own moral distress. But mm -hmm. uh, the term was not something that was bantied about. It was, it was more um, a visceral type of emotion that families would have and staff. Okay. Sure, a visceral kind of angst and, and distress over the situation of the isolation, perhaps, you know, within the nursing home center and sure. not being able to see their loved ones. Yeah, I think, um, as someone said in, in the chat, you know, I think it's, they use the term despair and exhaustion. I think despair is a, a good word here, too, that we've heard that people do, did feel that they were despairing. And also, um, I think someone indicated here that discussing feelings is difficult, you know, especially when they feel as though they're blocking out the traumatic experience of caring for patients, you know, at the beginning of, of the pandemic. And I think that's, that's also true. Yes, Margaret. Did you want to say something, Margaret? No. No. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, you know, Christine, I wanted to ask you a follow up question here because um, you have argued that perhaps, you know, we need to refocus or perhaps maybe we direct our attention to the moral strength of nurses and perhaps not focus as much on moral distress. And I know some of our colleagues have also focused on other terms such as resilience. And I'm wondering, you know, has the pandemic changed your thinking in any way? You know, we certainly have seen the strength of nurses. Yes, we've seen the despair, we've seen the exhaustion but we've also seen their strength. They, they certainly went to work every day, as did physicians, right? Trying to meet those specific challenges throughout the pandemic, but yet struggling. So has it changed your mind in any way or your thinking that we need to shift from the distress to much more of a strength-based perspective? So thank you for that question, Connie. And I, I think I've long been a believer that moral distress is one phenomenon that healthcare providers do experience, but they experience it against a backdrop of what I've called and you and I have called moral strength and, and, and moral resilience. That, you know, that there's a way that, they, that oftentimes healthcare providers have perspective or they have the ability to affect change or they have the ability to do things that minimize or mitigate or even avoid the moral distress in a situation or recover from it. So I've always believed that that's, you know, a, a part of the spectrum that we don't pay enough attention to. Now, whether shifting is the right way to think about it or just expanding and understanding the full spectrum, I think might be more what I think is right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I do think that, you know, during the pandemic, as you just said, Connie, most nurses and other healthcare workers continued to show up, continued to provide care mm -hmm. and to do the best they could under some sometimes really difficult circumstances. And continue in my mind to exemplify commitment and strength in what mm -hmm. they do. Um, so I would say the pandemic hasn't shaken that belief that I have of that underlying strength and resilience. However, I do think that the, something like this pandemic, the COVID, and certainly we've seen it, can challenge the commitment, the strength, and the resilience even of healthcare professionals in a, in a more profound way than under normal circumstances, which are sometimes challenging enough. I also think that healthcare providers are experiencing more moral distress during the pandemic than they might have again under normal circumstances. So, so it's really, you know, there's, there's sort of like everything on steroids in a certain way. And mm -hmm. yet there's a way in which the, the sort of basic premises of these experiences, I think still persist. I think it does challenge us to think a little more carefully about, you know, the differences in emotions, as you were asking in your last question, of, of the range of emotions, the differences in experiences, and also to somehow um, 
I don't know if it's more data or more a focus, but uh, not to lose the, the phenomenon of moral distress as an important phenomenon, but to, but to make sure we understand it in the bigger context. Sure. You know, that healthcare providers have an incredible amount of strength and commitment that they continue to exemplify. Sure. So that's my... Yeah, Nancy, did box. you want to <laughs> comment on that or? Uh, no, that's okay. We can we can go to yeah. the next. That's just fine. Yeah, but I did want to ask you, Nancy, though, about you and your colleagues did develop an ethics framework, especially early. You know, at the mm -hmm. beginning of the pandemic, mm -hmm. and um, that was to really help sort of understand some of this uncertainty, some of the emotions that people were facing within the clinical center, the distressing situations that clinicians found themselves in. And I'm wondering if you could just talk to us a little bit about that framework, why you decided to develop it, and um, how you think it potentially has helped at least to mitigate some of the moral distress that people were facing early on in the pandemic. Oh, absolutely. I'm happy to talk about that. Yeah, in, um, I and uh, uh, other colleagues in, in bioethics had uh, done uh, work back in um, around uh, 2006. Some of you will remember uh, the Bush administration had uh, call, issued a, a call to all the states that they had to have pandemic plans uh, using, and at the time it was using a flu model. And there was a lot of attention to the fact that there was no guidance given about how to actually do this and or no attention to how um, um, ethical challenges that were foreseeable should be managed. So we put together at lightning speed, a consultation on this issue at the Hastings Center. And because we had people who had been uh, involved in uh, Hurricane Katrina, in 9-11, uh, mm -hmm. um, in SARS, in, in Toronto, we had people who had frontline experience in managing different kinds of public health emergencies. So it was very interesting. And we um, created this very practical tool at the time, focusing on the kinds of people that you have to think about in a pandemic. And I always remember um, Nancy Cass, uh, the a great um, a scholar of public health, uh, coming in and saying, I keep thinking about truck drivers. I keep th thinking about people who deliver things, who weren't on anybody's radar screen. And of course, who we've been talking about all the time in, with essential workers in this crisis. So um, when we began to hear how bad this was going to be. One of my colleagues, our communications director said, I, I see you did this project 15 years ago. Can we do something with it? And he literally said, could you maybe get the old band back together and, and work it up? And I said, oh, <laughs> wait a minute, you know? And so I did, he dug out the PDF, uh, you know, from some archive and I read it on, I was coming from Baltimore at a meeting at Hopkins and I was going mm -hmm. to, up to New York and I said, okay, we, let's see what we can do here. And I did call some of the old band back together as well as some new people. And literally that sense of urgency, I had a flight, it was my very last trans, uh, continental trip after that. And I wrote from New York City to Phoenix, you know, just you, there was a sense of urgency, like trying to keep ahead of what was going on. And we very quickly had to, when you, we talk about frameworks and ethics, you had to get something into place fast. And so you say, there is always a duty to plan. You don't wait for a crisis to happen and then try to figure out what you're going to do. But you realize it's plan, plan, plan after another. There is a there is a duty of care to the vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So you think of healthcare workers as vulnerable when you're thinking about contagion, yes. but you also think about the populations you're serving. So it's, there's attentiveness to the community you're serving, who yes. is in the community. Even you, you don't yet know who is going to be most vulnerable, but you you have to keep your eye on vulnerability. Um, and you recognize the need for guidance, that you are going to have to create practical guidance for a, a rapidly changing situation. And this is the idea of going from a standard of care to contingency standards to crisis standards. Yes. So it was just preparing people's minds for thinking differently, saying that no matter what, you can't just focus on your own patient and that, that sure. relationship, you're going to have to very quickly learn to think in a public health context. And, and so we issued that supplement, just a few, we issued it on March 16th. Um, and then we had three more supplements throughout the year, but uh, it was, uh, it was um, quite a process to try to get something out that quickly. And then you just hoped it was it was speaking to people in the moment. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you so much for that work because I think it was very helpful to people and clinicians to get something out as quickly as you did. And I think you're absolutely right. 
you know, as a clinician, we tend to think about that patient in front of us. We want to do good for that patient in front of us. And we want to individualize that care for that patient in front of us. We're not thinking about the sort of broader sort of population health, you know, perspective that was absolutely needed during this pandemic. So thank you so much for that work. I think it was really helpful to clinicians on the front line. Margaret, I, I did want to ask you a question because you are the director of nursing services at a long-term care facility, you know, that does care for vulnerable older adults. And certainly you were balancing an administrative perspective and responsibility with the functioning of a healthcare organization. So can you share with us what those concerns were, how you worked through it from an administrative perspective in that position? You know, how were, was your organization able to adapt to the crisis while others were not? Because you had indicated to me that your organization did pretty well throughout uh, the pandemic. And that in part is probably thanks to you, you know, for shepherding through with the policies and the mandates that were necessary for your vulnerable population. But could you talk to us a little bit about that? Um, you, you had mentioned to me last week about the climate, and I think you absolutely must work in a, in a very good climate with positive leadership to help shepherd through. We, we have wonderful uh, climate, yes. Uh, our facility is, is very small. It's an independent home, third generation uh, family run. They are on boots on the ground there every day. So they're owners and the administrators. Uh, for us, the biggest concern when we started was preparing uh, the families and the staff for worst case scenario. Fortunately for Arkansas, we were late to the game. So we got to see everything that happened in all of the other states that the uh, pandemic hit first. Mm -hmm. And we used that information to plan so that we knew what was coming and could, could prepare better than the, those states that were hit right off the bat. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I think we were, we were blessed in that result. Uh, we had to get support for our infection control program, which was pretty severe. Uh, when you're used to families being able to come in 24 seven and visit uh, whenever they want to, uh, to have being one day open and the next day there was a mandate that says the doors are closed. Uh, we had to educate them what, what to expect in an outbreak situation, worst case scenario, here's what your options are going to be for healthcare. You can do A or you can do B, uh, here are the pros and cons to both of those situations. Uh, so uh, we, we had to do that. Our top priority uh, was the needs of the residents. So administratively, we had to uh, focus on empowering the staff with the tools that they needed to take care of the residents. So that meant we had to uh, jump ahead and make sure we had everything we needed before anyone else even knew they were going to need that. So we, we used the time that we had um, to get everything, get everyone engaged. Um, we did a lot of cheerleading for all of the successes when we uh, didn't get COVID right off the bat, like everyone else around us, we, we celebrated those successes. Um, we, we got masks from um, not normal distributors. <laughs> and we, would, um, we would check in places where normally you wouldn't find them. Uh, we, <laughs> did a lot of uh, interesting things to try and, and get all of the supplies that we needed uh, as quickly as we could. We invested in a, in a robocall application to, uh, to get information out to the families quickly, uh, always with a positive spin. Uh, here's what's going on. Here's what we're doing about it. Uh, this is what we can celebrate and, and uh, made sure that they were very well aware of everything that was going on. That was critical to having their support. They had to know what was going on and be part of the plan. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Margaret, for that transparency, you know, was absolutely something that was needed. And I think that issue in of itself has created many concerns for communication um, across the board with regards to um, the distress that people were feeling. So thank you so much for that, Margaret. I wanted to take a pause here and just read some of the comments from uh, our audience. And, and like, I would like you to try to respond to this because I know 
this has been a discussion that we have had about moral injury, um, you know, and how the concepts of moral distress and moral injury might overlap and how we think about them. So let me just read these comments to you and then I'll ask you to, to comment on them. Um, so thank you all who indicated these comments. Um, I think Moshi had indicated here that moral injury resonates more with me as an intensivist and a clinical ethicist. PTSD also originates in the study of mental health in war veterans. Someone else indicated that in my view, moral injury is also real and healthcare providers are experiencing it during the pandemic. However, in my view, moral injury is not an inevitable outcome of moral distress. From the perspective of capitalizing on strength of nursing here, this is a time for nursing to emphasize and define that professional nursing is the essential core of the healthcare system. There are more situations in which you had to choose between suboptimal solutions or the right thing to do was not available at all. Prior to the pandemic, there were many more right options to choose from and more flexibility to do so. And then someone else argued that moral injury is not inevitable, but it will result from unmitigated, repeated moral distress. I think Christine and I think that too, but we'll, I'll let Christine speak to that. And then as a physician, um, and thank you so much to the physician here as well, because we know that physicians have also faced moral distress. I am troubled by the effect of repeated moral distress on our nurses. They are indeed the core and nothing happens at the bedside without them. So I'll stop there and then I'll read the others, but um, just, if you could comment your thoughts about, you know, this confusion between what is moral distress, what is moral injury, what is moral stress? <laughs> I think, yeah, um, we've also had those conversations, but I welcome your thoughts on that, just to respond to the audience about those concerns. And I also, the, the strength of nurses, you know, we have the core strength within us, you know, to, to address these potential issues and concerns. So Christine, do you, do you want to start? Sure. I'm, I actually agree with most of the comments. I think that um, I, I do believe that moral injury is a real phenomenon, and it's, but it's not an inevitable outcome of moral distress. But it is something that could happen if there is repeated, unmitigated moral distress over time. Um, and, and, you know, I'm sorry to hear, actually, that some of the hospitals have gone back to business as usual without paying attention to the, the, the enormous toll that this pandemic has taken on uh, nurses in particular, but physicians also and other healthcare providers in, in hospitals. And so I think you know, some, of, some of what it requires from my perspective is all of us as a, you know, as a nation or maybe as a world to reimagine the importance of taking care of the well-being of our healthcare providers. And as somebody in the in the chat said, you know, nurses are the core. I mean, you can't have a healthcare system mm -hmm. without nurses. And so they are absolutely critical to this this thing about, you know, we need to take care of them so that they can, can take care of us. But it's not just nurses. It's all of the healthcare providers across the board that we need in order to have a functioning healthcare system. So what we ought to be doing, and then I'll stop, is you know, take a, take a pause here and say, this has had a major impact on the well-being of healthcare providers and not just healthcare providers. I mean, as Margaret has said, families and you know, frontline workers everywhere. I mean, I think a lot of people, but we need to, in healthcare facilities, begin to put better systems in place to try to promote and protect the well-being of the people that work there. Yeah, uh, uh, no, I, I agree. Uh, Nancy, did you want to comment? Absolutely. Um, we, um, we are seeing enormous pr uh, pressure to get back to business as usual. People are tired of, of dealing with, no one can live in a state of emergency forever. Hospitals and for their bottom line want want patients back. They want to reopen elective surgeries and, and so on. And so I, one thing, one question I always think about when, I, when I'm involved in um, empirical bioethics is when we talk about audiences, how high will our, our recommendations actually penetrate? Mm -hmm. I mean, if we start talking about we have to transform American healthcare, is that really going to happen? Is, is that really going to happen? And if, there, if, if it isn't, and we've got the system we have, and we are dealing with a very non-ideal situation, then what is the level, what is the highest clinician level, the chief of nursing, the chief of medicine, 
who are the, the people who are responsible for wellness, people who are responsible for occupational health and safety, uh, people who are responsible for uh, community health. There's a lot of push to put um, equity officers into, into hospitals now. Mm -hmm. And so we have to, I think, think about our audiences very strategically and, and be very realistic in the kinds of recommendations and metrics that, that are coming out of our research rather than just sort of abstract calls for more justice or being kinder or something mm -hmm. like that. That's what the times demand. Mm -hmm. Can yeah. I respond to that a little bit? Sure, of course. Before Margaret yes. goes. I, yeah, of course. I agree with you, Nancy. And I, I do think that um, there is a need, however, at pretty high levels to recognize that this is a problem. And I think you know, and every, maybe, maybe many people know, uh, the National Academy of Medicine, for example, has been focusing on provider well-being for a while. And the American Nurses Association has been focusing on provider well-being. Um, so some of those national level organizations are paying attention to this, I think pre-pandemic, but also now. And I noticed that some of the people in the um, chat were recognizing it's not just not doctors and nurses, right. and I 100% agree with that. It's mm -hmm. across the board. Yes. everybody who works in a healthcare facility and and also people who work in other professions as well I yes mean, so it's it's a real you know paying attention to what kinds of things help well-being across the board is something we do have to do at a high level and at a local level yes i i absolutely agree on that i mean it's chaplains as someone said in the chat it's respiratory therapists uh most definitely it's other social workers, other frontline housekeeping, you know, other individuals that are part of that system that make up that system that help you provide the quality of care that you want to provide. They too, you know, have also suffered throughout the pandemic. Um, Margaret, I'm sorry, did you want to have any comments here as well? Uh, I, I agree. I think, I think we have to look at everyone. I think if we were, it's probably very simplistic, but I think if we were all kinder to one another and, um, and just, took a, a beat and, and looked and saw who was stressed and, and just tried to be nicer uh, to those people uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, uh, that would go a long way. I agree completely. We would not be able to have done what we did without housekeeping, without the, the maintenance staff, without uh, even our suppliers coming in and doing what they did to try and get us what we needed. Uh, it's a team effort. It always has been. And, mm -hmm. and we, we always have had to watch out for each other. And I think during the pandemic, we, we had to rev that up a lot higher level. But uh, it, it's not... It's not something that can't be fixed with, with a little bit of kindness. And I know that sounds very simplistic, but... I think we've lost a little bit of that in, in this country. Well, it is the ethical principle of respect for persons. And, and I agree. I agree with that. You know, we need to be a bit more respectful, you know, with each other and the issues, you know, that we, we have been facing. I think, you know, some of the comments in, in the chat, you know, have argued about, you know, what's going to happen long term here? Are we going to lose uh, really qualified people? within the system. And I think all of us are worried about that. I know we've talked about that, you know, and how do we sort of measure these concepts? And we're, we are trying to do that uh, for the future. Someone had also asked about just the political environment and how that has influenced, you know, decisions. And I, I did want to ask a question about misinformation, because I think the political environment is part of that, this question that someone asked in the audience. And during the pandemic, we have faced a crisis, sort of an ethics crisis of misinformation regarding the virus and also the vaccine. Some, some estimates indicate that about 88% of nurses are vaccinated, but that varies, of course, depending on the source and, and the methods of that particular study. And we do know that nurses and, and staff in long-term care facilities are probably below that percentage. I think I read something, maybe 50% or higher of, them, of those are vaccinated. So this has also been a source of moral distress where nurses are frustrated with patients, for example, that might not be vaccinated or perhaps even their own colleagues who might have specific reasons for not wanting to be vaccinated. So I guess I'm wondering, you know, I, I like your thoughts on this. You know, how should we handle this? <laughs> nurses are the most trusted professional group in the country, but they too were mistrusting. Um, and we re have read reports, I think about a month ago of a nurse who refused the vaccine. And then unfortunately she did pass away from the virus. So I think, I do think nursing is well positioned as someone said earlier in the chat, 
you know, we need to use our own strength to communicate with the public. So how do we do better? <laughs> uh, and that's probably a very difficult question to answer, but do you have thoughts on that? And Margaret, I know that you handled it a bit differently with regards to vaccination of your staff. And I'd like to hear your thoughts as well on that as your state, as you indicated, had a lower vaccination rate, but is doing much better. Um, I think as the recent reports have indicated. So I'll open that up to, to anyone who might want to respond to that with regards to our communication practices and the political environment as someone indicated in the chat and the influence of that. Well, I'll have a go with, at that if you like. Um, sure, Nancy. Um, in, terms of, um, in terms of communication, the, the question of, of uh, there, you know, our prep questions, there was the idea of nurses being the most trusted by the public. I think we have to be very careful about pre-pandemic data because mm -hmm. given the high mistrust of any form of authority that we have seen, um, I don't think we can say that this is this is a trusted group, or this this group is responsible for being a vector. We've seen all different, very situational um, approaches to trust mm -hmm. and trustworthiness that I think are being unpacked, not just because of the pandemic, but also because of the racial uh, reckoning with racial injustice. The mm -hmm. idea of who is worthy of trust and and who is uh, mistrusted. So I think we have to think a lot about that. Sure. Uh, I would say that systems, not just professionals, need to be trustworthy, including as vectors of information. Um, we've learned that community health centers, FQHCs, which tend to be nurse-led, have earned high trust from their communities. They consi consistently succeeded in vaccination of medically underserved populations, in part because they invested in community outreach involving community members. They employed people. They, they, they provide services in the languages of the community. And they were also a very trustworthy destination. So you could, you could bring, if you were afraid to ask somebody else for help with say interpreting your gas bill, you could bring it to the, the clinic and they would sure. help you with it. Even if it wasn't about healthcare, it was about your health. Sure. Um, I also, I do research with the Harvard uh, Joint Center for Housing Studies on uh, issues involving um, older adults, but also involving, we have a project called COVID Recap, which is about housing focused responses to COVID. And this goes to the, the, the mission of New Cortlands, I think, and talking about uh, transitions. We're learning that service coordinators in senior housing were a group that may have demonstrated high trust. Uh, they were fixing Wi-Fi problems. They were um, arranging for people to kind of uh, get home care services kind of pooled, you know, to say, we've got somebody who needs something, their care worker can't get here, but your care worker is here. Let's see how we can fix this. So I think we need, even though a lot of people on this call probably work in health systems and especially in hospitals to understand who in the community was, uh, is a, for one thing, a, a, a care worker, a provider of health in some way, and also who was seen as trustworthy, even if some other institution was not seen as trustworthy. Mm -hmm. Sure, thank you. Christine, did you wanna to comment too? I'd love to hear from Margaret first. Yes, Margaret. And then I will. Okay, uh, we, we started out by providing vaccine education very early on. We had uh, 15 minute standup meetings every single day on every shift that all the staff would go to. Uh, we utilized the CDC's educational material on vaccines, and we did one-on-ones. If someone said, I want to talk to you about this, and why, why should I get it? We, we did that. Uh, we brought the vaccines to the residents and the staff very early in the process. In December, we gave vaccines, and we gave them to residents and staff on the same day. So they were all in it together, and uh, we had a very good turnout and a very good response. And we celebrated the people that did get vaccinated. And we, we didn't uh, isolate the ones who, who did not get vaccinated, but uh, when we were able to move from N95s to surgical masks for a short period of time this summer, we did that. And then of course, you know, when Delta hit, we, we moved back into N95s for everyone. But there was a time when there was an advantage to being vaccinated and not needing to be swabbed um, because you were vaccinated. Sure. We just kept pushing it. And we have, uh, out of our staff, we have three left that are not vaccinated. 
and one resident that's not vaccinated. So our percentage is probably around 97 uh, for, for the combined between the residents and the, and the staff. So I think we're doing pretty well, um, but that, that is a, a big part of, of us just working as a team to try and, and beat this so that our residents uh, are safe. Are safe. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret. And I'm so I just I'll just add I I love to hear Margaret's story because you know so much of what we read in the news or on the media is about nurses refusing, and I think we don't have good numbers on how many nurses are vaccinated um, or how many healthcare providers are vaccinated. We really don't. We've seen some stories of you know systems that have begun to mandate vaccines for their healthcare providers and and even in some places uh, terminate people who haven't been vaccinated. And, you know, there are two that I've read about. I don't, I, I don't know them personally, but, you know, the Houston Med Med Methodist Hospital in, was one of the first to require vaccines of all their employees. And there, was, there were some very vocal opponents among their employees. There were suits brought, et cetera, but they put a date on there uh, at which everybody had to be vaccinated or they would be terminated from their employment. Mm -hmm. And the numbers are something like they have 30,000 plus employees and I think 150 ended up being terminated. So that's, a very, that's mm -hmm. not very many. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, Northwell apparently had a similar situation where you know, out of 86,000 or something employees, maybe a little over a thousand uh, decided not to get vaccinated and, and therefore lost their employment. So I think the story has to be told a little bit more broadly. And so I love Margaret's story because there's an example of 97%. And you know the, not, the Navajo reservation is another one that, that is apparently 90 some percent. Mm -hmm. um, and part of the reason I understand from the Navajo experience anyway, uh, resonates with something that Margaret said a few minutes ago. And that is there was a deliberate attention to the fact that we need to take care of each other and especially need to take care of the elder members of our society. And so if we believe that, we would, we would act differently, I think, than we sometimes do if we're not focusing on that aspect of um, motivation for getting vaccinated. The last thing I would say is, you know, as, as healthcare providers across the board, I think we have an opportunity and probably a responsibility to be informed and to talk to people, whether it's our patients or our um, colleagues, but also you know our neighbors and our friends and our families, so that they can be they can have access to reliable information, and they can have access to somebody who can talk to them, talk them through their concerns and their worries without judgment, so that you know they can make a decision. And in the end, if people decide not to get vaccinated, that in the end is their choice. Even if they're a nurse, they may not be able to work in the facility that they've been working in, but they've, they've made a choice on their own. The thing that makes me the saddest are healthcare providers who seem to be deliberately spreading disinformation. That I don't know what to do about, but that's a real problem in my, in my book. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, many comments in the chat are, you know, should we have vaccine mandates? And I think that's a very difficult ethical question to, to think through when we respect autonomy of individuals to make their decisions and the right to self-determination, yet we're in a public health crisis. But many nurses have also faced um, angry patients. I think as someone said in the chat, you know, that they're screaming at them or they're treating them quite badly. And that I would think, um, creates moral distress or adds to the moral distress that nurses are facing when you have to work with patients that are do not believe that it is a real virus and that are taking it out on their healthcare providers. Um, one thing I'd like to add to that, Connie, yes. back to the issue of mandates, this has been a very nuclear hot topic in, yes. in many ways. And, and many we've had many discussions in my state, in the Empire State Bioethics Consortium about people not liking it, but then saying, but we have to, in, in part because of what was going on in, in long-term care, the yes. idea that people, the residents were isolated because of outbreaks uh, during staff and uh, among staff. And 
one thing that I'm not a clinician, but I have been subject to vaccine mandates in the past when I've been a volunteer. Um, I've had to show proof of many vaccinations mm -hmm. and, um, and, and that I didn't have TB and things like that before anybody would badge me at a hospital. And I remember early on asking a friend who works in HR at a large uh, healthcare center saying, well, it's part of you know, when does it come in? She said, oh, it's part of onboarding. Of course, people have to show that they've mm -hmm. been vaccinated because it's, it's basic to patient safety. Mm -hmm. So, and I can remember from being on um, earlier HHS working groups on um, resistance to mandatory flu vaccination, seasonal flu. One of the things that researchers who studied this topic would say is the more non-normal something is, the more resistance there is. The mm -hmm. more it's typical, the easier it is. Because we all are used to like getting that last email reminder, if you do not enroll in your health plan today, you will be dropped from the healthcare. And we do it that day. It's a mandate. You know, mm -hmm. so there are all kinds of mandates in work life and in healthcare work. Sure. But this one has been seen as so because of the public health emergency and, the, and, the, and the, the fact that there was a vaccine that didn't exist and now exists has been seen as so hot. But right. I do wonder over time whether this will be, will be less and less of an issue. We shall see. We shall see, yes. I cannot believe that I only have five minutes left and I have not asked all my questions to the panelists um, that we're almost out of time. Um, but let me ask this, this final question, and it could just be your initial thoughts about that. But because we are a research center at the University of Pennsylvania, do you still think there are types of perhaps conceptual or empirical questions that we need to ask or think about with respect to moral distress or other areas that we need to think about as we move through this pandemic? Certainly loneliness or social isolation, I think, as Margaret indicated, and how that might impact moral distress. Have we learned all that we need to know about moral distress? I would say no, because I only have five minutes and I haven't asked all my questions. Um, or has the pandemic opened the door to sort of a broad range of issues that we still need to understand? And I'll open that up to anyone that might want to answer that question. I can, I'll say something quick. I think uh, at, um, one thing that Penn is, is, is quite distinguished at is uh, medical sociology, medical anthropology. Um, we, are still we are still thinking about a pandemic that happened over a hundred years ago, the Spanish uh, flu epidemic. Mm -hmm. We are still processing what happened during the HIV AIDS epidemic. Yes. We, we must resist the urge to just sort of move on and imagine that we understood what happened to our society as well as our, our healthcare system. So I do think we are, uh, as, as in terms of normative research, it isn't just focusing narrowly, although that's important, on concepts experienced on the front line, but more broadly broadly on the societal impact of a, a crisis like this. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're going to need people who are reflecting on this and maybe coming together regularly to, yes. to, to, to help us uh, process this. And I also, my, my final, final thought would be, we need to talk more about care and care work and not just healthcare work, because yes. certainly the impact of this was felt more broadly in all sectors where people give or receive care. Yes, absolutely. thank you. I think I would just add to, I agree with Nancy and I would add a couple of things. I think we actually need more research on moral distress um, to understand how it is different from and related to things like moral injury and resilience and all that kind of stuff. I think we also need to understand better the, the individual factors that set somebody up for more moral distress. You said loneliness. Loneliness is a great example, but there may be other things mm -hmm. that we don't fully understand. Mm -hmm. And maybe most importantly, we need to understand the institutional factors that create moral distress. And we talk about ethical environments. We, yes. we have some information that they make a difference. Um, yes. We need to understand them better. And then we need interventions. We need things that we can do to yes. both uh, minimize the chances of moral distress and moral injury, but also sort of help people get through it. And somebody in the chat said something about, you know, let's not just focus on resilience because that puts all the stress on the individuals who are yes. experiencing distress. And Connie and I have talked about that for <laughs> years. Yes. And yes. We, we really agree with that. I think yeah, resilience do. is important and taking care of the individuals is important, but the systems need to uh, the change. As well. Yes. And Margaret, I know you come from a, a community perspective. Is there anything that we can do to engage patients and families, you know, in these conversations as we move forward with the pandemic? 
I, I, I think we need to look at the strategies that were effective in keeping families connected and engaged. Uh, what worked? Uh, certainly a lot of the televisits and things along those lines, there mm -hmm. are things that, that impacted on a positive note, people uh, being able to survive this. And I would love to see some uh, research into what worked as yes. far as, as, as keeping people connected and engaged. Thank you so much. Yes, I, I agree. I didn't get to my question on telehealth, but I think that is an important question for us to think about, especially with regards to ethical conversations. So I have one minute and let me just close by saying thank you to all of our panelists today. I, I thank you so much for your insights and your thoughtful dialogue and for your willingness to come and speak to us today. I think all of us, I speak for us at the University of Pennsylvania and the New Cortland Center and our audience that our hope is that we can move forward in a way that we can build better systems where nurses are valued and respected for the care they provide to patients and families. And it is my hope that their health and well-being and the resources that are needed within the institutions where they work will be a priority, as all of you have indicated, so they can flourish and we will be able to retain them. Without nurses, we know that the system is unsustainable. So thank you so very much and have a wonderful afternoon. And thank you to the audience. We will review all of your comments. I apologize that we could not get to all of them today, but we certainly will look at them and think through them and hopefully have another conversation in the future. Thank you all so very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Connie. <laughs> thank you, Christine. Thank you, Nancy. Thank, thank you, Connie and, and Mary. <laughs> and Mary. Thank you and Mary. all. Thank you. Mary. You are absolutely fabulous. Thank you. Yeah. And I hope <laughs> we can. Thank so much, Margaret, for joining us. Yes. Was... Thank you, Margaret. Was... 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 Nice was... you. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. I hope we can preserve they, the they... chat. The yeah, chat is fantastic. It was fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I was torn between trying to read and listen. Um, it really, really engaged. Uh, I, I, I totally agree. This cannot be business as usual. There is whomever made that yeah. comment. We have got to learn and grow uh, from this um, unbelievable experience. So thank you. This was fabulous. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Margaret, for taking time on your vacation to do this too. Oh, Margaret. Oh, that's especially wonderful. Yes. <laughs> that's commitment. Yes, that's commitment. commitment. It is commitment. You know, Margaret, I, I read something that was in the New York Times actually on Sunday about hospice and where they also are suffering from a shortage of nurses and now patients and families cannot uh, are not able to um, get into these hospice centers when and they're completely distressed because we don't have the staffing because nurses have left. Um, and it just it's really sad. And I thought of you, you know, because of that article. So thank you for the work you're doing and really wonderful. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.